Today is December 15th, 2020, and we are doing artisan tile tools of the trade for the NTCA Roundtable Live Artisan Series. I'm here with Lee Callowart of Dragonfly Tile in uh, Wisconsin, and I'm going to turn this over to Lee. Hi, Lee. Well, thanks everybody for being here for this session on tools. Um, well, I'll be talking about the ring saw and uh, we'll probably have to touch back on tools again at some point in a future session, but I'll give you enough information to at least uh, get started. Um, we all know that the wet saw is probably the most important tool when it comes to uh, making artwork as Joshua showed you. Um, and if you're in a trade, you have, in the trade you have a wet saw. So there's no reason for you not to experiment. Um, Mark, let's, uh, let's roll the first vid. Well, one of the reasons I like to use the ring saw is I can, obviously you can make uh, tight turns. Uh, one thing really nice is you can get very sharp points without them blowing off. You know, even on very brittle materials such as onyx, you can still get a nice sharp point on it. Um, a lot. I, I've been trying to use materials that are difficult to cut, chip easily. Um, for some reason, are just difficult pieces of material. But you can see with the ring saw, you can cut curves, very sharp points, and very minimal. I mean, that's not sharp at all, hardly any chips at all. Um, you can actually just go round and round and round. You don't have to back out. Just come around and just keep keep going in a circular motion. Um, this is really a very brittle marble, but once again, you can see it holds very sharp points. This, uh, this particular uh, porcelain is just awful for chipping. It's just, whoosh, look at that. But on the ring saw, very sharp points and very clean, clean edges. Um, there. <laughs> uh, okay, well, and next I'm gonna show you a couple of tips on how to cut some of these things, cutting relief points in and um, in and out and backing up with the blade. So before we get into um, actually cutting with it, the first thing I want to do is show you the inside of this saw and uh, just discuss a few of the things that can help you with the, uh, with the maintenance. So if you want to show that one, Mark. I just want to show you the inner workings of the Revolution XT ring saw. Um, the belt is probably going to be the, the thing you're going to be replacing the most. It's not as often as what you might hear, um, but that's why you make sure that you have extra so you don't have to shut down to break the belt. The next thing would be these blue pulley wheels. Um, if you have, if you hear a sound change, a tone change while you're running the saw, stop it immediately and check it because you could save a belt. If the bearing blows, most of the time you're going to lose a belt. Um, when you replace these bearings, make sure these pulley wheels, make sure you super glue these caps on um, to keep debris out of here. Um, and also, if they pop off, they could get caught in here and just uh, derail the belt, possibly break it. Um, on this one, I have a glass plate. And what I found out though, is that this one that's wrapped, double-sided, uh, really is the only blade you need. Um, it replaces all the other blades. You can cut anything with it, glass, porcelain, quartz, um, stone, whatever. Um, but just make sure that you have spare parts so that you're not frustrated when something goes um, 
goes awry and you're just sitting there wondering what to do. Um, they say you don't have to dress this wrapped blade, but I still like to hit it once in a while just because of all the different materials that we're using in our projects. So that's just a brief rundown on the ring saw. I guess the other thing is when you do this, when you when you do have to do some maintenance, clean all of this out real good. Get get all the debris out of here. Because when you're cutting, things will fall through here. Small pieces, small shards will get down in here. And hopefully they drain through this drain hole. However, if they're swimming around in there, they can cause you problems. Yeah, and it's another thing is it's it's a good idea to make, as you can see, I made, uh, I cut out bins and made tubs for these saws to sit in to contain the water, to keep it running all over the floor, right? Um, and you see that one's lower and one's higher. The lower one, uh, that guard is in the way. The higher one, I can get bigger pieces um, on the table without any obstruction there. Um, the other thing is to, uh, if you see, uh, a drastic color change in your water, whether, you know, because you're using a dark uh, material such as a black granite. Um, you want to clean that reservoir because you're pulling all of that sediment up through the pump onto your table um, and you can't, you, all of a sudden your lines are disappearing, whether it's white sludge, black sludge, or gray. Um, so just another another tip on keeping it running smoothly. So if we can go to the next. Okay, so in cutting this shape, what I don't want to do is come all the way around here. And when I get here, I'm gonna I might have a hard time making that turn to come back and do it. So I just cut a relief point in here. So when I come around here, this piece will fall off. I'm gonna turn this on. And the main reason you want to put those relief joints in there is you, you don't want to back out of the cut you just made because you're not only going to uh, damage your fine cut and reshape it, you could bind the blade in there and that's bad. <laughs> that's bad for a few reasons. Um, it can snap a belt, it can bend your blade. Um, so the other way to do it is to back out using the back edge of the uh, blade. And you'll see that in another video. But then you're using, uh, you're putting wear and tear on the blade that's unnecessary. And we can turn the volume back up on that. So I'm gonna come back and cut the interior. <laughs> What I was saying there is you want to, you want to let that blade true itself and let it kind of walk into the point and not force it. That's how you'll get a nice sharp point. So right there, it's a tight corner. So what I'm doing is I'm using the back of the blade a little bit to clean out that tight uh, radius and then continuing through the piece. As you can see, I didn't take my time and get it perfect, but you can see how that works with the relief joint. Yeah, that relief joint, I'll probably talk about that more um, 
but there's just it's it's a time saver it saves the shape of your piece uh less wear and tear on the blade there's so many reasons to uh to do those in some cases you don't need them because you can use the back of the blade which i'll show uh i don't know if it's the next one but you'll see some of that as well okay because i didn't spend a whole lot of time making that perfect on the cut i can come over here to the uh shaver Curve a little bit better. And if it, with something like this, sometimes it, I get this gets in my way. So I'll just take a sponge, a piece of sponge, put it down in there, make sure it's soaked. And that way, I don't have that in my way. I can go all the way around the piece. So that's a couple of tips on the shaper. You can also put this fine on here. You drop this down, this drum down far enough to get this one tight with the Allen screw. Now you have a for tighter, smaller turn uh, uh, curves like that, you can shape that. Yeah, and that's the uh, wizard uh, glass grinder from Inland Craft. And just so you all know, uh, the Guild has a promo code. If anybody wanted one of those, we get, uh, I think it's 10% off if you, uh, punch in guild 10 if anybody would is interested in that so that's kind of cool um so what do we have next mark so this time i'm not going to have a relief joint pretend there's a pretend there's some lines there um but with this blade you can actually back out uh but not down the same cut because then you'll chip up your finished cut turn this on and even with, um, it's amazing how well Onyx cuts on these saws. So in that case, you don't need a relief drum, but you're not always going to have that ability. If you have things like this that aren't tight enough to do that, this you probably won't be able to make that turn without chipping this up. We'll see if these lines stay on. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you have to learn your materials um, and at what speed to make your turns and. Uh, some you can go quite quickly, some you have to slow down. You always have to pay attention to the blade being true. Uh, sometimes with a harder material, you'll have a tendency to uh, lean left or lean right, uh, putting a lot of stress on that blade. So sometimes I'm cutting a harder material um, I'll slow down my cut and let the blade true itself. If you just keep going and you put too much force on it, uh, you could damage the, the blade. You could, you could potentially, uh, snap a belt. Um, so just let the material tell you how fast you can cut, how quickly you can make a turn. Um, as usual, you're always kind of listening to your, uh, tile or stone when you're fabricating it. So 
see there again i'm just using the back of the blade to finish that inside radius not backing out i'm only using it to shape um i think uh the last one i'm i'm cutting some glass because I think it's always kind of a, you know, it always becomes an issue because some of them are foil back, some are painted. Uh, the the best, uh, best glass to, to use in your projects is something other than those rubber back, foil back, painted back, any of those. Um, yes, you can do it, um, but they do take a lot of extra shaping and cutting upside down perhaps, uh, but there's a, there are a lot of uh, options out there other than those types of glass. So I think I show one on this last video. We're always test cutting our materials for our projects um, before we um, submit our final design. This is one, obviously the painted black back uh, glass is always a pain. Hey, this time I think, um, you know, this thing shoots water. A little guard up here. You stay a lot drier. Look how it turns on. Like I said, here's the painted back version, which is most glass out there today, in a larger format, especially, is going to be this type of this type of glass which some are, some are better than others. They're not all bad. Um, just some of them are fired on their different, uh, different materials and aren't as bad. So from the back going at that speed, that chipped it up quite a bit, which I can have, which we can fix on the shaper, but that, I mean, from the front, um, so with, if we wanted to use this, it looks like we may have to go the back. Yeah, and the, you can't, you know, in this case, it worked a lot better from cutting from the back. It's an extra, it, you have to put all your templates upside down and everything, but you can use, you can do it. Our template upside down will come to the back. Because, see the difference? Some of the techniques and workings of the ring saw, um, it just allows you to do some more intricate cutting, some things you can't necessarily do on the wet saw without sectioning it and making more pieces out of one. So um, I hope that helps clear up some of the, I know there's a lot of Q and A goes back and forth once in a while about these ring saws and you'll get both sides. You'll get people that all oh, that thing is always, you know, breaking down, it's too finicky. And then the next person will say, I love my ring saw. So like any other tool, uh, you have, it's a learned tool. So um, if you do get one, as my dad always said, let the tool do the work, um, learn it. Every time you cut something, uh, learn the speed in which to cut. Learn uh, how intricate you can get with that material. So just take the time to really learn it. Don't treat it like a wet saw. It's not a wet saw. That, that blade is uh, obviously not a wet saw blade. Um, so you, all, you're, all you're dealing with is the rim of your wet saw blade. So yeah, you have to be able, but you saw I was cutting things relatively quickly. Uh, different materials. So, um, yeah, give it a shot. Hey, Lee, that was terrific information. Tools of the Tiled Trade with Lee Callowar, uh, <clears throat> ring saw, the shaper, some glass tools used in the tile trade. Who knew? Lee knew, and he told us. Lee, thank you very much. Outstanding information. And thank you, Mark, and thank everybody for being here today. Welcome everyone. Today is December 15th, 2020, 
and we are here with the NTCA Roundtable Live series. This is the Artisan Edition, session number three, where we're talking about tools of the artisan Tyler trade. And I'm here today with Joshua Nordstrom. Joshua? Hi, how's it going, everybody? So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about um, uh, cutting tile on the 10 inch wet saw. And I'm talking 10 inch wet saw because um, it's a little bigger saw. You got a, a lot more room to work with, um, with the, between the blade and the table. And uh, it's just, and you got more blade, uh, there's more surface area on the blade for a uh, blade for shaping and what I call manipulating um, because you're pretty much manipulating the blade to make these cuts. Um, so with that being said, with the 10 inch saw, that's what I prefer. Uh, you could probably do it on anything. I've never tried it on a smaller saw, but I would imagine it would work. Um, but, you know, talk about the right blade to use. I use a solid core blade, uh, one with no segments in it. And um, I guess I can explain that here really quick. I've got an example of a solid core blade. No, there's, you know, no segments in it. Um, we've got a blade here that's got some, I don't know what you call these, but they've got little notches in them. These work, but sometimes those flex a little bit and then that'll chip your tile. So if you got these, they work. Um, but using the solid core blade, uh, when your blade's spinning, you're actually running, your blade's spinning. And when I say manipulating your blade, you're, you're running your tile through and you're, and you're using the side of your blade you're, you're for leverage um, but when cutting your tile and you don't want uh, the segments because if there's segments in there, your tile is going to be hitting the segments when it's spinning and it's going to be chipping your, your tile. So um, just pick a good, you know, depends what you're cutting, but a good solid core blade is what you want. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about safety too. Um, obviously you want earmuffs, you want um, eye protection. Hold on, my dog wants out one second. One second. Okay, sorry. Um, you want you want your earmuffs, obviously, and um, eye protection. And uh, you know, if you're cutting outside, obviously, and there's um, airflow, you don't really have to wear a respirator. Um, I have a cutting booth in my shop uh, that I close the door on, and it's got. Um, uh, air circulation with it's just a, a high CFM fart fan, uh, like a bathroom fan that I put in there and I turn that on um, to, to dump the air. I, I cut in my cut room so it uh, so I don't completely fill my shop up with tile dust. Um, and then it's well lit. I've got on both sides of my saw, I've got uh, two, two spotlights that shine right on my blade. So it's nice and bright. And then I always wear a headlamp. Um, just so I can see exactly what, what I'm doing. So, so um, you know, you want the light so you can see, so you're not going to cut your fingers off. Uh, you want the respirator so you can breathe the rest of your life. Um, hearing is very important and your eyes are pretty darn important too. So just be safe. I've seen a lot of guys cutting uh, without safety gear. Um, uh, one other thing I'd like to mention is, you know, if I'm standing in front of my saw for hours on end, cutting a lot of tile, I like to wear rain gear too because I just get soaking wet. Um, so that's another thing is, um, you, you might want to put on some rain gear. Um, I guess we can just go ahead and roll the first video, Mark, and, and I can kind of talk my way into it and through it here. Um, uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, a comfortable height for your saw. Um, can you pause this, Mark? Is that possible? So if you see my table, the table in my saw is pretty much right here, chest height. So in my cut room, I, I built a, uh, I built it up so my saw sits up so it's this high. And then I took my tray out of my saw and I've got a, like a 30 gallon water reservoir that all the water circulates on. So with my saw up at this height, I'm looking the tiles right here. I'm looking at the tile. I'm not bent over like this for hours on end. Um, that's gonna kill your neck and back. So you want your saw at a comfortable height you don't have the luxury of making a cut room. You know, I've 
I've put my saw on like milk crates in the past, uh, boxes of tile, whatever you can to get it up to a comfortable height. So if you're gonna be cutting for any extended period of time, you wanna make sure that your saw is at the right height. Um, let's see here. Okay, you can go back to the video. Cutting is, I, you can see my forearms. I, I just rest my forearms on the tray, uh, just kind of lean on it. Um, and I'm, you can see I'm pushing the tray and I'm using my hands, like you can see what I'm doing there. Uh, use your hands a lot. So a lot of times, you know, I mean, it's a combination of pushing your tile with the tray into the blade and a combination of your hands pushing it in. Um, you can notice here that I'm holding the tile. I'm not trying to cut this on my table. If I'm cutting it on my table, um, the tile, you know, the, we all know that the, the blade's gonna be uh, your, you know, your, your tile is going to hit the blade and you're not going to have a 90 degree cut on your tile. So when you come and look at your tile, the cut edge is going to have a, a rounded to it. And when you go to put all your pieces together, they're not going to fit. So I, I hold, I hold my piece up and try and get it a little higher on the blade. So I get a nice square, a nice square cut versus something that's got a, be a bevel to it that I got to go back and reshape. So that's something you want to think about too is um, holding your tile nice and tight, keeping your fingers out of the direct line of the blade in case it grabs that tile. Sometimes when you, it'll bind and it'll grab the tile and it just pulls it out of your hand instantly and it'll pull your hand down into the blade. So you wanna make sure your fingers aren't in the way of the blade, um, obviously. But I hold, unless I'm making a straight cut just to take off the main meat of a tile, um, I hold my tile off the table and I'm doing all my shaping off the table. So I guess we can go back to the video. Um, we all know that dressing our blades is important. And it's really important when you're shaping tile because you're, you're putting some serious strain on the, on the blade. Um, and it, they get pretty quick. So, you know, I don't even know what brand this is, but it's just a dressing stone. I like to run it a couple times down each side of the blade. And um, because you know, you're not only using the front of the blade to cut, you're using the sides of the blade uh, for the shaping mostly. So I really like to, um, to dress, I, I, I dress the blade, I don't know, probably every five minutes. I'll just run it through there and um, it, just, it, it prolongs the life of your blade. So if, if you guys aren't used to using uh, dressing stones, I'd certainly go out and get one. Um, and, uh, it really helps out. You, you don't get as many uh, chip tiles and um, they're good. So play the third video, Mark. So there you go. I'm, I'm, I'm cutting like a half moon tile here and I'm taking as much out as I can with a straight cut. And um, I'm leaving, I usually leave about an eighth inch to a three sixteenths of an inch of tile um, around my line. And that is enough tile to where you can shape it on your saw and manipulate your blade before it actually binds up and wants to grab your tile or stop the saw. So it's kind of hard to see there, but you can see I'm taking out as much as I can, just kind of combing it. And then I'm going to leave like an eighth of an inch around. And then once you got that, then you can start to push it in and shape it. And you can see here how, see how I'm using the side of the blade. I'm pushing my tile through the saw and I'm using the side of the blade at the same time as leverage, right? You see the, the, the gap there in between the, the tile and the blade. So that I'm using the blade for leverage to get a nice, that nice inside radius. And you can see how I'm holding the tile off the table and holding it up. So I'm getting a, a nice square 90 degree cut and I'm not getting that curved cut that I have to go back in and um, shape. So when, you know, when, you, when you're done cutting, all the tiles fit together. You notice how my fingers are not right in the way of the blade. They're, they're on the side. Uh, you know, sometimes if you're cutting a really small tile, which we'll get into here, my fingers are right next to the blade. And we all know we could touch the side of the blade. You could touch the blade uh, it's not going to cut you unless you really shove your finger into it. But you want just want to make sure safety. You keep your fingers out of the way. Um, this this tile doesn't show it. I think it'll show it on another video here. But I I like to put an X on the side of the line that is the waste. So when I'm cutting the tile out, 
um, I always know which side of the line I need to save. And you wanna just make that line disappear because when you trace your template over that tile, um, you, you wanna cut, because you can, and you're putting your Sharpie line around there, you take your Sharpie line away and then you have your tile that, that's left is the exact same size as your template. And um, if you cut it with a 90 degree um, cut on it, like I was suggesting, uh, when you're all said and done, they should all just fit together like a puzzle. Uh, and then it's just a matter of going and, and dressing the, the, your cuts if they're chipped with either like a, uh, a diamond pad or if you've got a um, uh, like a, a glass uh, shaper, you know, like the, the stained glass guys use for um, shaping their glass. That's, a, that's another great tool for, for cleaning the edge of the tile. And play the next one, Mark, and see where we're at. Okay, so I did the inside. We all know that the outside um, curves are a lot easier to cut because you can just run them um, around the outside of the blade and you're not trying to get the inside. Um, here we go, cut. I like to cut everything, as many straight cuts as I can and get the whole thing um, down to it. So I leave my eighth of an inch around my line and then I can go back through and then just run it through the saw. And there again, you know, you're using the, 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 the blade as leverage here, but the outside radiuses, they're a lot easier uh, than the inside radiuses. But, uh, you know, sometimes you're really pushing on that blade, you know, that blade will be moving on you a little bit. And you know, if you've some, sometimes the blades go bad if you uh, use them too much, they'll get a wobble. Um, they'll, they won't, uh, they, they won't cut straight. Um, and that's, that's just a sign of just putting too much force on it. And it's probably time to put a new blade on. Um, so yeah, just, um, there you go. You could see how much of the line that I left there, 16th of an inch to an eighth of an inch, three sixteenths max. Cause once you get in there, it's going to start binding up and then those chunks just fall off as you're going around. Right. Use the side of your blade to shape with. You can see there, there's a little bit that I had to cut out of the middle. It wasn't quite a 90 degree, just kind of shaping it back and forth. There it is. Voila. One thumb up. <laughs> okay, okay, so those bigger tiles are a, a little easier uh, cutting. This next uh, video, um, I'm showing you how to cut small tiles. You know, I'll cut some tiles that I'll cut or will be as big as my fingernail or, you know, small as my fingernail, real tiny. And those are really hard to, um, to cut out of a big piece of tile. So what I like to do is I'll cut strips, like little half inch, three quarter inch long strips, just run them through the saw, let them dry. And then you got little strips and then you can use your strips to trace your small tiles on. And there's two good reasons for that. Um, because if, if you were, say this was my tile and I wanted to put a little tiny piece of, you know, this is, the, this is where I wanted to put my, uh, my small tile to trace out. Okay, well I can trace it out on this tile, but then now you got to flip that tile over and you got to label the back of that, right? Because if you're cutting hundreds of tiles out, they all have to have a label. Otherwise you're going to sit there and scratch your head trying to put your puzzle together. So the benefit of having a little strip is you can put your, your little tile on there and you can trace it out and it's easier to flip that over and write the labeling on the back. And then it allows you to hold that strip as you're running it into your saw and you can shape each individual tile, there might be three or four tiles on the strip and you can shape each individual tile using the remnant, the rest of your stick. So you're not trying to hold the one little tile and, and cut it in your saw. So um, you'll see here on this video, what I'm trying to explain. So we can play that one. That's the next video, but this video here I'm showing, so this is some absolute black granite and um, it's hard to get a black Sharpie line on black granite. So what I like to do is put blue tape on it and, um, and then I put, and then I'll trace my, my tile out. And then I will go over it again with mosaic tape and that's just a clear film. And that just kind of helps keep the blue tape on there while you're cutting. And that allows you to see your line 
and then it allows uh, your line to stay there and the water jet to not blow the line off. As we all know, sometimes when you, you go to cut a tile, you get about a quarter of the way into it and your line disappears. And then it's just trying to guess, you know, if it's a straight line, you can guess pretty well, just keep pushing it through. But when you got curved lines, it really helps to, to be able to see your line the whole time. So the blue tape uh, works great. And if you've got mosaic tape, that works even better to put another layer on top of it. And then uh, you can, you can um, see your line the whole way. You can see there how I've made all my straight cuts and I left my eighth inch to three sixteenths of an inch around the tile. And now I'm just going back and shaping it, right? And, and take, take note to how I'm gonna be using the side of this blade as leverage. Not so much on the outside cuts because I'm, I'm using the, the front edge of the blade to cut the tile. But as you, as you go for an inside cut, you're still using the front edge of the blade, but you're using the side of the blade too. And you're using the, uh, the side of the blade as the leverage so you can get in there and turn your tile and, and have a st stable hold on it. Um, see here. There you go. So I'm using the side of the blade and you can see I've got that and be aware too and when you're cutting to keep that 90 degree edge you can see that uh, ooh, that was that was convenient to have the water spot there. <laughs> uh, so you can see you can you can move your tile up and down as you're running it through the saw so you keep that 90 degree edge and um, uh, it's, so then when you put everything together, they all fit together nice and tight, and then they don't fit together like this. Yeah. Okay. So I believe the next video is what I was talking about with the small tiles. So um, we can go into that one and I'll I'll re-explain what I was what I was talking about. So here's a here, I've got like a three quarter inch strip and I think I've got three tiles traced on it. So you can see some of the tiles are really small. Yeah, I'm just about cut the first one off. There, now it's separated from it and I've pretty much shaped the whole thing except for like the last little quarter inch of it. There you go, now it's done. So now I've got this little guy. I'm keeping it on the stick instead of cutting it off separate and trying to shape it individually. Sometimes when you try to shape those little tiles individually, they just fly away. And then you got to go back to the starting board and um, retrace them. So there again, using the sides of the blade for le as leverage, and I'm running it through. And I'm keeping as much of that tile on there as I can, making my straight cuts, shaping it and then there so you can see like the last little quarter inch i've shaped the whole thing except for that last little quarter inch and then i can cut that off and then give it the last little final bit of shaping and then that can go on the done stack and then you can see when it's on a strip like that how small they are and how hard, you know, and how easy that would be to flip over and write, write a little tiny number on the back. Now try to imagine putting that in the middle of a big tile and flipping that over. You do the finger trick, right? And the tile and you flip it over and you try to write your number on there and it doesn't work so well with a small tile. So it works really well to, to make the strips, to pre-cut the strips and dry them. Uh, it's a, it takes a little extra time, but in the long run, I think it saves you time. Something you want to be aware of too is you really want to pay attention to the sounds that your saw is making when you're cutting. Um, if your saw is bogging down, obviously you need to not push so fast. Um, when you're manipulating your blade and you're putting some side pressure on the blade and you're torquing that blade, um, you know your your saw will slow down. It'll start to make different noises that it doesn't normally make. Um, you want to keep that saw at the highest RPM that you can. Um, to keep that blade spinning and get a nice clean cut. So pay attention to what your blades or what your saw is sounding like. And um, you don't, what you don't want is you don't want it to bind up and grab your tile because it's going to pull that tile down and slam it down on the table. And if your hands are under that, um, it'll slam your, I've had it happen many times. It, it slams your hands down uh, between the tile and the table and it hurts. It's like somebody smacking you with a hammer. Um, and that's why I, I was, 
uh, emphasizing that you do not want to have your fingers in front of the blade because if that happens, it's going to pull your finger into the blade and just like that, you could look like that. So um, make sure to, to keep your fingers out of the way of the blade. Um, one other thing that I, I want to mention is I call it blade erosion. You want to make sure when you're running your tiles through and you're cutting, um, if you've got a long tile that you're running through, um, this isn't quite long enough, but something that might be longer. If I'm if I'm running that sideways here, if I'm running that through, and this is my cut edge, and I'm running that through, and I'm shaping this. So by the time you get over here, and I'm still trying to shape this side, this side of the blade will affect what you've already cut, right? And I call that blade erosion. You want to make sure that your your tile that you've already cut the cut edge isn't going to be affected on this side. Um, you know, sometimes when you're cutting um, and, you, and you're going in, let's see, how can I do that? <laughs> sometimes when you're cutting and you're going into it, um, there we go. You're going into it and you want to make that little cut and then you turn and you're starting, starting to use your leverage. Um, if you, if you don't have, if, if it's, if it hasn't gone through enough and if you haven't taken enough out and you're, and you're already starting to turn, the side of your blade is still going to be taken tie the it's still going to be cutting the tile so you want to make sure you're past past the diamonds and you're on just the blanks the blank blade before you start using it as leverage if you start using it as leverage too soon you're going to get blade erosion and it's going to disfigure your tile and it's not going to come out the shape that you want it So um, I don't know if I have anything else to say. I think, was that our last video, Mark? That was our last video. Okay. Um, I guess, do you have any questions, Mark? Uh, Joshua, I've got a comment and that is watching you do this and explain this really showed me a tremendous amount of skill in using the tile craftsperson's largest tool in their arsenal, the largest, loudest, biggest, fastest running tool that we have to do precision work for the smallest micro miniature mosaic pieces, custom handcrafted possible. What a, a great explanation of how to use this big tool to do fine crafting with small pieces and very intricate pieces. Yeah, well, thanks. You know, I mean, I think if anybody's been standing behind a tile saw for a number of years, um, you know, anybody is capable of doing this. I mean, I know we've all cut out who knows how many toilet flange holes on our wet saw. And, you know, a lot of guys will comb it, you know, and make a bunch of straight lines and comb it and then knock the combs off and then go in there or take a grinder and, and grind it out. I hear a lot of guys um, that just like to scribe uh, with grinders and grinders are great. They work great. Um, I'll pull out my grinder for the occasional cut that I can't get with my saw, but I find grinders like to chip a little bit. So um, yeah, it's just a matter of uh, blade manipulation and just knowing the boundaries of your saw and your blade and what it can do. Um, uh, yeah. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> one, one note to make there, Joshua, on the grinder. A lot of grinders, unless they're equipped with the uh, manufacturer's water delivery system, they don't fall under OSHA's table one for their respirable airborne silica uh, regulation. And like you mentioned, we need to be safe. And part of being safe is not breathing this fine silica dust that's uh, generated by dry grinding. The silica dust that comes out of dry grinding uh, porcelain tile or um, stone, um, they're sharp. And they, when we breathe them in, these little sharp particles get into our lungs and they don't ever come out. And you end up with a disease called silicosis. So OSHA has an airborne respirable silica regulation that has a table in it, table one, and it lists as an acceptable tool, they call it an engineering control, uh, a wet saw basically that has a manufacturer attached water delivery system doing just like you were showing us to keep that dust down. Yeah, 
Well, I think a lot of people think that um, just because there's water there, that eliminates the dust, but that dust is still there is in vapor. So that's why, you know, I, and I lock myself in a little cut room and there's not much room for that vapor to go anywhere. So that's why I make sure to wear a respirator. Um, the wet saw helps, but it doesn't eliminate the dust. So just remember that uh, just because it's a wet saw doesn't mean it's dust free. Um, there's still dust, but it's in the form of water vapor and it'll do the same thing to you. You know, I mean, you might just think, oh, I'm only making a couple cuts. But if you only make a couple cuts every day of your life and you're, on, you know, you're in this this field for 20 years, that's going to add up. And um, you don't want to end up with respiratory problems when it's all said and done and you want to be sitting on a beach drinking Mai Tais somewhere. So that's yeah, right. You're very you're, important. You're exactly right, Joshua. The, that dust particle is still uh, trapped in the water. So if you breathe in that vapor, you're getting that. So be very careful. Think about what you're doing. Joshua, that was a tremendous discussion on uh, tools that a tile artisan, a master craftsman like you uses. Thank you very much for that. Uh, extremely informational and educational. And I'm sure many people watching this will uh, work with their tile saw, work with their wet saw, and, and they can recognize uh, the uh, methods that you were using and they can use those to create some handcrafted masterpieces of their own. So. Yeah, you know, I'd like to just add, you know, if anybody wants to like private message me or to get a hold of me through Facebook, you can even call me. Um, uh, I, I'm willing to answer any questions at any time and walk people through any steps or any any problems that they're encountering. Um, I'm just, I'm here to help. I love seeing everybody stepping their game up and stepping out of the, the square grid of, of uh, grout lines and, and doing fun things. It's, it's really encouraging. Joshua, thank you very much for all of that you give all of us in the tile industry. We really appreciate you. Thanks for all you're doing and thanks for sharing all this with us today. This is the Artisan Roundtable Live session number three. It's December 20th, 2020. And I'm here with Angie Halford Ray. And Angie is going to uh, tell us about the tools of the artisan that she uses in her job and her business. Angie? Hey, everybody. Um, I just wanted to show you three of the hand tools that I use on a, a very regular basis. Um, they are standard nippers, wheeled nippers, and what I call score and snap tool. Uh, there's different variations of that tool from different um, manufacturers, but it's something that I like to use uh, to, to break down large sheets of glass because I, I work a lot with um, with stained glass, but I use it in a mosaic way. And uh, so these are some of the tools that I use. All right, you can start the first video, Mark. Okay, so I'm gonna show you guys some of the hand tools that I use all the time. Um, one is wheeled nippers. I use these all the time. And I'm going to show you an example. I use them for glass mostly. So really you shouldn't use them for anything but glass. And this is one eighth of an inch thick stained glass that I use to make tiles. And uh, I'm going to show you how to basically use them like scissors and you just cut and uh, if I was going to make a circle you, you start with square okay so I've got this squarish piece and in order to make a circle I go through and I clip all the edges and 
go all the way around. Until it starts forming a circle like shape. And after, once I get the shape that I want, um, then I will take it, you know, the edges are pretty rough. So after I get the shape that I want, I take it and then use the, um, the shaper tool and grind up the edges and smooth it out. But basically, if I just wanted triangles, because I need 100,000 triangles for something, I will start just cutting triangles. And that's basically how to use the nipper tool. And it doesn't make perfect straight lines, but I work a lot with mosaics. And if I want to make a correction or to make a specific shape, I just, um, I just work, work this until I get the shape that I want. So that is not a perfect triangle. If I wanted that to have three sides, then I, I cut it until it becomes the shape that I want. All right, so that's that for you. Okay, I also want to mention that um, whenever I showed that example, my hand was holding the pieces and it looks more dramatic than it really is, but I think some people like prefer to um, cut inside of like a container or something. So the reason why I captured my hand around it was to prevent little shards from flying all over the place. Um, but you can also, there's different techniques to that. I have just gotten used to doing it my way, but there's uh, many ways to do it. Um, sometimes I'll cut inside of a large bowl or um, underwater even. I've done that to um, just to be able to collect the little tiny shards that get everywhere. So, and of course, always wear your safety goggles. I don't wear safety glasses. I actually wear goggles go all the way around because um, safety glasses isn't, they're not good enough because I've had pieces of glass just fly up and um, goggles work best for me. So I guess you can start a second video. This is a what I call a score and snap tool. It has a wheel right here and it has feet on it. So what I use it for is for scoring glass and cutting them into workable pieces. Um, and basically you start sort of in the center and you score. Okay, you can see my score line. And then you put the feet at the bottom and snap on your score line. And there you have uh, another piece. Now, you can't really get really small pieces with this, but I have used it to make branches before. So the branches were about a quarter of an inch or more. And it makes. It's a pretty handy tool. Now, I'm not usually concerned about being precise when I am doing um, this because I usually use this tool just to break down my glass into smaller strips. And you can take very large sheets of glass and then and cut it down like this with that tool. All right, there's that little score and snap tool. All right, that one uh, 
pretty self-explanatory. I uh, basically just use that tool for um, taking larger pieces and making them smaller into smaller workable pieces. And um, moving on to the last video. This tool I use a lot for stone and uh, ceramic and marble. And when I'm working with marble pieces, um, I remove it from whatever mesh it's on. And let's say I needed to make a curve. I will take this tool and um, do a technique called keystoning. So you see I've got this angle and then now I'm going to make that same angle on this side and just nip it. Sometimes it's not perfect. And it's probably because of the way I'm holding it right now. Um, and then basically you just take these nippers and you bite the area where you want it cut. So for example, if you were making a, um, a curve with your mosaics, I've got some that I've pre-cut and they cut pretty well, you know, just to, for making small angles. So you're definitely able to make curves and other shapes. It's really handy. I actually use it a lot. So if I want to, you just take that and bite it. And I always put my hand around it, so you have to be careful not to get pinched and, um, and bite it. Real simple, but very, very neat tool. And these three tools I basically use every day. All right, hope that explains some things. Um, this, is a, this is a polishing pad or like a sanding pad for stone. So if I wanted a more perfect shape, you know, see this is a little bit rough. So I just, you can sand it down. And now it's all smooth again. So these are pretty handy. This is the, um, 60 grit and I have all the way to 400 grit to polish it completely if I want, but typically it's not necessary for what I do, but I do like to take off rough edges. So there's that. That's how you cut little marble mosaics with nippers. And also I'd like to mention about the nippers, the standard nippers, you can cut many materials with that, not just marble. <clears throat> uh, they don't cut granite, <laughs> but they will cut through um, ceramic and porcelain, but it, you know, you have to put a lot of pressure on um, with porcelain to get it to cut. And some, it just varies. Just try it, test it out on different materials. Uh, I'm always trying to practice and use my tools in ways uh, just to test out and see what they are capable of doing. And sometimes you'll find out that one tool, you know, works really good for one particular thing, and that's what you use it for. So it's not like hand tools are very um, crazy expensive. It's a, it's a good investment to get a few of, of little small mosaic hand tools and also even stained glass tools for doing 
uh, work, detailed work like mosaics, uh, stained glass tools come in handy as well. But that's about all I have for you. Well, thank you very much, Angie. That is some terrific information on how to use those uh, seemingly very basic or simple hand tools to do magnificent works of art in the hands of a true artisan like you. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I spent a lot of years practicing with them, so. <laughs> it takes practice, it takes skill and experience and a knowledge of uh, your materials like you described and all of those things. So thank you for sharing that information with us, Angie. Yeah, you're very welcome. All right. Well, we'll see you next time.